Hey, I like that. All right. Can you hear me better? Better? Thank you. I don't have to scream now. Um, so I'm not going to start over. Um, Paul wrote um, at least one letter to Ephesus. There's some people who believe that he wrote more than one letter. And there's indication in the letter that we have recorded. Uh, Paul wrote this letter from Roman, uh, Roman prison. And it was during, the, um, in this letter, there's a, at least one indication that he had written a previous letter. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But the, uh, the book of, Eph of Ephesians contains six chapters. And it can be divided into two parts. Uh, chapter 1, 2, and 3 is um, uh, highly doctrinal in nature. And it deals with uh, uh, the Christian's position. And then chapters uh, 4 through 6 is more practical. And it deals with daily Christian living. Uh, the Christian's practice. And so what we want to do is tonight we're going to look at uh, really chapter 1 and 2. And we won't spend a lot of time in, in either of these. But we want to look at chapter 1 and 2. And then tomorrow night we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 3. And uh, if you have to miss a lesson... Uh, I hope you don't miss tomorrow night because it's this chapter where Paul tells us about God's plan, his eternal plan for the church. And if you have somebody that you've been thinking, you've been studying the Bible with and, and uh, they might want to learn more about the church, I hope you'll invite them especially to be here tomorrow night. And then on Wednesday night we'll talk about chapters 4 through 6. And we, Again, we can't do it justice in a short time, but if we can just pique your interest and get you to... Uh, do a little bit more study, deeper study of the book of Ephesus. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul is going to remind the Christians about their position as children of God. Who they are, uh, where they are, and what they are. And in this chapter, uh, depending on the translation of Scripture that you're using, uh, somewhere between 13 and 15 different times, Paul uses the same phrase. To the beginning, at least, of the book of Ephesians. And the phrase that he uses is the phrase, In Christ. Over and over again, it's almost like Paul is trying to, to pound into the mind, into the head of these people and all of us that if you belong to Jesus Christ, you are in him. And he's going to say this over and over again. And uh, he begins in verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus who are faithful in Christ Jesus. So he begins by saying that if you are faithful in Christ, uh, if you're faithful, then you're in Christ. If you're in Christ, you're going to be faithful. And, and notice Paul calls these people uh, who are Christians in Ephesus, he calls them saints. Did you know that you're a saint? If you're a child of God, you're a saint. Now, there's, uh, uh, I've known some Christians who, who don't act like what we think a saint ought to act like. Um, there's a story about a, a, a fellow who called the preacher one day, and he said, uh, uh, my brother has passed away. And I would like for you to do his funeral. And the preacher thought about it, and he knew that this man was not a very good man. Uh, he had a, a bad reputation uh, in business. He was known as a, a crook, and uh, he was a womanizer, and he wasn't a very good man. And the preacher said, I, I don't think I can do his funeral. And the fellow said, uh, I will pay you very well if you'll do his funeral. As a matter of fact, he said, I'll give you $1,000 if you'll preach his funeral. Said, okay, I, I'll preach his funeral. And he said, and if you'll call him a saint, I'll double your pay. Well, the preacher thought about it, and he got up to preach the funeral, and he started out by talking about this man, and he said, everybody knows he was not a good man. And everybody knows that he was a crook, and everybody knows that he was a womanizer, and everybody knows that he was a heavy drinker. But I want to tell you, folks, that compared to his brother, he was a saint. Well, that's not the kind of saint that Paul is talking about. Uh, here in Ephesians chapter 1. And so Paul, what I want us to do is just kind of go through chapter 1 
And I want you to notice all of the times that Paul uses this phrase, in Christ. Look at verse 3. And you know what verse 3 says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Now, zero in on those words, in Christ. Look at verse 4. Just as he chose him, or chose us in him, before the foundation of the world. He chose us in him. Look at verse uh, 5. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. Uh, look at verse 6. To the praise of the glory of his grace which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. So you have it in Christ. In Christ Jesus. Through Christ. In the beloved. Look at verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Uh, go down to verse 9. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention uh, which he purposed in him. Uh, look at verse uh, 10. With a view to the administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on the earth. You begin to get the, the flavor of what Paul is trying to do. He's trying to get the Christians to know and all of us to know that if we have uh, become Christians, then we are in Christ. Look at verse uh, 11. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. Look at verse 12. To the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. And, and by the way, um, kind of encapsulated in, uh, in this idea of in Christ, three times in this chapter, Paul is going to remind us of the purpose of the child of God. Uh, he says it, first of all, in verse 6, that we are to live our lives to the praise of his glory. Look at verse 12. He says it again, that we live to the praise of his glory. Look at verse 14. Again, to the praise of his glory. And it's my conviction that as children of God, that the purpose of every child of God is to live a life that glorifies God. And if somebody asks you, what is your purpose in life? You know, there are a lot of businesses that have purpose. A lot of, a lot of uh, uh, schools have a purpose statement or a mission statement. Um, when we go to meetings over at Freed Hardeman, uh, we sit in a room, in a board meeting room, and they put a placard with our name on it at the place where we're supposed to sit. And on the back of that is written the mission statement of Freed Hardeman University. They want us to know, to be reminded over and over again, what is the mission so a lot of churches started developing a mission statement. And uh, I, I think that a lot of times in doing that, we've confused mission with purpose. Uh, there's a difference in our purpose for living and our mission in life. And, and I think I've confused it in my own life at times. I believe our mission as children of God is to take the gospel to the world. That's our mission. Um, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Uh, Mark 16, Matthew 28, go and, and teach the gospel to all nations. Uh, Luke says every nation. And so that's our, our mission. Jesus told the apostles in Acts chapter 1, begin in Jerusalem and go to Judea and to the ends of the world. That's the mission. Uh, Luke 19, verse 10, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the law. Our mission is to uh, teach people the gospel to help people get to heaven. But our purpose, every person who is a child of God, our purpose is to live a life that glorifies Him. So don't confuse our mission with our purpose. Our mission is to, to, to get to heaven and to tell other people uh, how to go to heaven, to take others with us, but our purpose is to live a life that glorifies Him. And so Paul says that in Ephesians 1, verse 6, verse 12, and verse 14, uh, three different times that we live our lives to the praise of His glory. Uh, look at verse 13 of chapter 1. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Uh, so uh, you're in him when you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, and you're in him when you've been saved. And how were you saved? By listening to the gospel. And that verse is important because when we get to chapter 3 uh, tomorrow night, we'll see... Um, how these people came to know the gospel and how that message was presented. So it's by hearing the gospel. Uh, go down to verse uh, 14 or verse uh, 15. For this reason, I too, having heard of the faith 
in the Lord Jesus. Uh, verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Uh, verse 20, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. In verse 23, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So if you came along and you didn't know the book of Ephesians as well as you do, and you're not studied as much as you had, and you picked it up and you started reading Ephesians chapter 1, and, and you, you read this phrase over and over again, in Christ, uh, in Christ Jesus, in him, uh, in the beloved, uh, through Christ, if you read that, you would get a sense that that's important. It's important to know that, that as children of God, that is our position. Now, you all know that the only way to be in Christ is by being baptized into him. And we learned that in, in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, and uh, Galatians 3, verse 27, and uh, in Paul's Corinthian letter, uh, we learned that in many places. And when you have been baptized into Christ, you are then in him. And, and here's the good news for, for all of us who are children of God. If you are in Christ, listen carefully, if you are in Christ, nobody can ever take that away from you. That cannot be taken away from you. And when you've been baptized into Christ, based upon your faith through the hearing of the gospel that he talked about there in chapter 1, you are in Christ and nobody can ever take that away from you. Now, don't misunderstand. Uh, it is possible for you as a, a child of God to walk away from Jesus. It's possible to fall away. It's possible to deny him. It's possible to uh, recant your faith in him. But even if you do that, and, and all the preachers who are here tonight, and all the elders would tell you this, even if you do that, when you come back, you don't have to be rebaptized. You know why? Because you're already in Christ. You're still in Christ. Now, you can be in Christ and not be faithful to Christ, and I believe that you can be in Christ and not even be close to Christ. That kind of sounds uh, strange a little bit, but that's a possibility because there are Christians who were baptized into Christ, but they've never grown in their faith. They've never matured. They've never uh, worked on their sanctification, their holiness, like we talked about yesterday. And because of that, they're not close to Jesus. But once you're in Christ, nobody can ever take that away from you. You know, there are, there are um, organizations and societies and, and, and social kinds of clubs, and, and there are positions in your work and... Um, in your community, and those things can be taken away from you. Uh, they can take your house away from you. They can take your uh, children away from you. They can take your family away from you. They can take your possessions away from you. But nobody can ever take away the fact that you are in Christ Jesus. And when you are in Christ, if they take all of that other, uh, all of the other things away from you, you're still in a good place because you're in Christ. And I just want to encourage you to, uh, to hold on to that with all of your heart and to know that you are in Christ Jesus and nobody can ever take that away from you. And so Paul begins this book to these people who he loved dearly by reminding them that they are in Christ Jesus. Now there's a second way that Paul talks to them about their position in this book. He talks not only, he, he not only wants to remind them that they're in Christ Jesus, but he wants them to remember um, how they used to live compared to how they live now. And so throughout the book, you're going to read what we call um, uh, formerly but now statements. And a number of times, Paul will say formerly, uh, and then he'll say but now. And so what I want to do is I want to I look at a few of these. And the first one is in chapter 2, verse 1. Paul says, and you were, now, now keep in mind, He's already said throughout chapter 1, you're in Christ, you're in Christ, you're in Christ. He's telling them over and over again, you're in Christ. And now he says, but you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And it's like he's saying, you're not dead in your trespasses and sins now, but you were. And he goes on to say, uh, verse 2, in which you formerly walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air. 
You know who that is? That's Satan himself. Of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. So Paul begins by telling them that they're in Christ. And then he says to them, there was a time in your life that you were dead in your trespasses and sins. There was a time in your life that you walked according to the prince of the power of the air. You listened to Satan more than you listened to Jesus Christ. There was a time in your life that you lived like people who are now the sons of disobedience. And then look at the next statement that Paul makes. Among them, uh, talking about the sons of disobedience, we too all formerly lived in the lust of the flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. So, so Paul is talking to these Ephesian Christians. He wants to remind them that they're in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. And he said, but formerly, you lived uh, according to the flesh. And you walked according to the desires of the flesh and the mind. And you lived like those who were the sons of disobedience. That's reminiscent of John's statement in uh, 1 John when he says that, uh, it talks about the lust of the, the eyes and the lust of the flesh and, and the pride of life. And Paul says, formerly, that's the way you are. You were. Uh, you were the, like the sons of disobedience. Uh, you were, um, by nature, the children of wrath. You uh, lived by the lust of the flesh and you indulged the desires of the flesh and the mind. And then verse 4 uh, begins with two of the, the sweetest words in all the Bible. But God. But God. Think about your own life. Uh, many people who are Christians at one time uh, lived a, a terrible life before. I've got a dear friend out in Texas, and uh, his name is Terry. And Terry um, was a part of a, um, a motorcycle gang. And he was in many fights, and he had a gun with him all the time. And he told me on one occasion, he said, I, there were probably three different times in my life that, that I thought that I was either going to be shot or I was going to shoot somebody and kill them. And Terry's wife was a Christian, and she would invite him to church, and he would, he would laugh at her. And later on in his life, he decided to change his life, and uh, he became a child of God. And he lives now a very faithful life as a child of God. And he says to me, Jeff, I don't know why God let me live other than the fact that he wanted to give me more time to become one of his children. And he said, I can't begin to explain to you the kind of life I used to live. Well, it sounds like that's what Paul is saying to these people. And my friend Terry, um, look, he, he, didn't, um, he didn't get himself out of that mess. He couldn't have done that on his own. He had to make some decisions and some choices along the way. But one of the things that we need to remember as children of God is that, that if it were not for what God has done, that none of us would be, be his children. It all begins with God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul is talking in verse 17 about the fact that old things have passed away and all things have become new. And in uh, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 18, he begins talking about the reconciliation that God has made available to us. And he says, all these things, watch this, all these things are from God. You know what that means? That means we didn't initiate the idea of salvation. We don't have enough education. We don't have enough knowledge, enough wisdom, uh, enough uh, educational acumen. We, we don't have enough creativity to save ourselves. We couldn't figure out a plan. All these things are from God. What Paul is saying in 2 Corinthians 5.18 is that everything that has anything to do with our salvation began with God. Romans 5 verse 8 and 9 says, But God demonstrated his love for us that even while we're sinners, Christ died for us. But God, Paul says, you didn't get yourself out of that mess, Paul says. Uh, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Uh, you were living like the sons of disobedience. Uh, you were like children of wrath, and you lived according to the lust of the flesh and the desires of the flesh and the mind. But God, and look at what he says after this, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. 
That's why we are children of God. That's why we are in Christ. Not because we are smart or we are intelligent or we are wise. It is because God was rich in mercy and he loved us with a great love. And then look at verse 5. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, God made us alive together with Christ. And then Paul kind of parenthetically says, by grace are you, have you been saved. Um, if you go down to verse 10, Paul says, for we are his workmanship created, look at this, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which were prepared for us before the foundation of the world. Uh, the word workmanship there comes from the Greek word poema. Uh, we got our English word poem. And it means, um, it literally means uh, masterpiece, uh, creation. Uh, you are God's masterpiece. You were created, you were recreated in Christ Jesus. And it was because God is rich in mercy and because of his great love with which he loved us. Well, um, go down to verse uh, 19 of chapter 2. You are no longer uh, strangers and aliens. So there was a time in your life that you were strangers and aliens. But now you're fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Turn over to chapter 4 and notice with me beginning in verse 21. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, what are you doing, Paul? He's reminding them how wonderful it is to be in Christ, and he wants them to know where they came from. In reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and you put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of, with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Uh, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Uh, look at chapter 5, verse 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them. And then verse 8, but you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. There's another one of those formerly but now statements. And, and notice in, in uh, chapter 5, verse 8, how Paul phrases this. He says, you were formerly darkness. Notice he doesn't say you were formerly in darkness. He says you were formerly darkness. The very character of your life uh, was a, the character that looked like darkness. Not, not you were in darkness, but you were darkness. And he says, but now, he doesn't say you are in the light. He says, but now you are light. There's a difference between being in the light and being light. And we are light because we reflect uh, the light of Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what Jesus meant when he was talking in the Sermon on the Mount, when he said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works, but that they may glorify your Father who art in heaven. Uh, it's about um, who you were compared to who you are now. And one other place that Paul talks about this is uh, back in chapter 2, and I want to ask you to go back there again to chapter 2. And I skipped this on purpose because uh, in verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 12, Paul gives us a, um, a full synopsis of what it is like to be in the world without Christ. So look at verse 11. Therefore remember that formerly you the Gentiles in the flesh who were called circumcision or uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. So notice Paul says formally. There's another one of these formally but now statements. And look at what he says in verse 12. Remember that at that time, and Paul is going to, to state five very clear um, conditions of how their life was before they came into Christ. Formally, he says in verse 12, you were separate from Christ. That's number one. You were separate from Christ. Number two, you were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. And, and by that, he simply means, and he's referring to the fact that they weren't a part of the, the Jewish race of people. They weren't a part of the Jewish heritage and the Jewish faith. 
and the way we would say that today is they were not a part of the family of God. That's the bottom line. They weren't a part of the family of God. So formerly, he says, you were separate from Christ, and you were uh, strangers from the uh, covenant of, or you were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. And number three, you were strangers to the covenant of promise. You didn't have all of the promises that you have now before, the, before you came to be in Christ. I heard about a preacher who decided he was going to count all the promises in the Bible. And he said he got to about 7,000 and he gave up. All the promises that were found in the Bible. Just think of all of the, the, the beautiful promises that God has given us. Promises like Romans chapter 8, verse 28. All things work together for good for those who love God and for those who are called according to his purpose. Uh, promises like um, Matthew chapter 11, uh, verse 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Uh, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Uh, he goes on to say, I'm meek and lowly. You shall be meek and lowly inside. Um, the promises of, of God. And all of these promises are a part of what Paul was talking about in Ephesians 1, 3, when he said the spiritual blessings that are found in Christ. So number one, you were separate from Christ. Number two, you were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. Number three, you were strangers from the covenant of hope. And number four, our covenant of promise, number four, you were without hope. You were without hope. We live in a world where people are, are desperate for hope. And God has given us, those of us who are children of his, who belong to him, he has given us a beautiful hope uh, that is unlike anything that human beings can really understand. It's a hope that the Bible calls a blessed hope. It's a hope that the Bible says is restored or, or uh, kept in heaven for us. It's a beautiful hope that someday that we will be able to spend eternity with God and with Christ and with the Holy Spirit and with all of those who have gone on before us. A blessed hope. But before you were in Christ, you were without hope. And then number 5 in verse 12, he says you were without God. You were without God. Can you imagine living your life in a world without God? What a horrible way to live. Without God, there, there's no peace in our lives. Without God, there's no hope in our lives. Without God, we don't understand really what love is all about. Uh, John tells us that God is love. And so um, we don't really understand love. Uh, there are four uh, Greek words that are used in Scripture to describe love. We use one word for love, and, and uh, we use it to describe everything. You know, I, um, I, love, um, I love Mexican food. I love it. Uh, I love uh, a good milkshake. People say, I love my wife or I love my husband. I love my children. I love my grandchildren. I kind of like my children, but I really love my grandchildren. Um, I, love, uh, I love apple pie, and I love, we, we use, I love my pets. We use that word love. And that's the way the world uses the word love. But the Bible usage of the word love describes a, a love that is not just a, a love that uh, is um, it's almost unexplainable. Paul called it, when he talked about the love of God, he, he said, I can't find the words to describe the love of God. And it's the kind of love that, that causes us to... To make up our mind, the word agape is the word, a word that means the love of the will. We have to make up our mind that we're going to love God. And we're reminded that he loved us when we did not deserve to be loved. So without God, there's not a real understanding of love in our world. Without God, there's no unity in life. There's no balance in life. And so Paul wants us to know, he wants us to remember what it was like before we were in Christ. So just think about those five things. You were, you were separate from Christ Jesus. Uh, you were uh, excluded from the family of God. 
you were strangers to the covenant of promise. You didn't know about all of God's promises. You were without hope, and you were without God in this world. And again, but God. But now, he says, but now you've been brought near, Paul will say, by the blood of Jesus Christ through his crucifixion. And he broke down the wall that separate us, and he brings us together. And all of that is only possible in Christ. And so tonight my prayer is that, that all of us who, who are striving to be what God wants us to be, who are striving to be his people in his church, that we will recall and we will remember what life was like before we came to know Jesus and that we will be grateful every day of our life. When I go to bed tonight, I need to pray and thank God for the fact that he placed me in Christ because I was obedient to his gospel. Because I heard, to use Paul's words there, uh, I received the, uh, the word of the, the gospel. I believe because of the receiving of the gospel. And that obedience put me into Christ. And nobody can ever take that away from me. So when you leave this building tonight, uh, my prayer is that, that you won't just remember where you've been, but that you'll think about that from time to time. But that you'll know where you are now. That you are in Christ. And if you're not in Christ, um, don't walk out of this building until you come to know Jesus. Until you are baptized into him. And we would be thrilled tonight to help you with that. And, and you don't have to have all the knowledge in the world. Uh, you need to know that your life isn't where it should be. And you need to believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he will do what he says he will do. And you need to turn your life over to him and confess his name and be immersed in water. And he will forgive you of all of your sins. He'll wash away your sins. He'll write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. He will add you to his church, and he'll put you on your road to glory. And he'll do that tonight for you. And you can leave this building in a different place than the way you came into this building. You can be in Christ. And if you are in Christ and you're living for him, I hope tonight that when you pillow your head, you'll give thanks to God and that you will praise him and that you will live every day of your life to the praise of his glory because of what he has done for us. Tomorrow night, we're going to look at the God's eternal plan based upon Ephesians chapter 3. I want to encourage you to read Ephesians 3 uh, sometime tonight or tomorrow. And um, it's one of my favorite chapters in all the Bible, Ephesians chapter 3. It's a beautiful, beautiful chapter. But if you have a need in your life tonight, if we can help you in any way, respond to the call of God. We invite you to come while together we stand and while we sing this song.